This is Jackson the Kid Knight, and you're listening to the MMA Edge Fantasy Podcast. Get ready for an hour, and who knows, of daily fantasy sports analysis from our panel of experts. Without further ado, let's meet the team from New York. He's the Don of all Beast Motors, the boat himself, Beast Mode Cow. From Cambridge, Minnesota, he's a father of four and has the most glorious beard in all of the DFS. It's Eric F. And last but not least, he's so St. Louis, ask his tattooist. He's the host of our show, the master of black Negro jiu-jitsu himself, Leroy Stephan. Welcome to the MMA Edge Fantasy Podcast for UFC 214. We got a big show. I got an interview with uh, Eric Shelton, Eric Showtime Shelton, who's going to be actually be on the card this week just got finished doing that um i've got uh of course i've got cg3 analytics here i've got eric f the return of b smoke cow and um we've got a full fight full of cards we've got three championship fights before we get into everything uh let me just give a quick shout out to my sponsors real quick before we get into this podcast, big shout out to our sponsor, Ball Club Box at ballclubbox.com. Ball Club Box is a sports apparel provider that provides their subscribers with monthly gift boxes full of quality licensed sports merchandise that reflects their customer support for their team. Use these, these items only to appear at specific stadiums or sports stores, but they intend to make it easier to customers to support their diet desired franchise without leaving their homes and in some cases state by offering this subscription service. You pick the team's. They pick the items and send them to you each uh, month. There's three different boxes. You got the club box, $55 for $75 worth of apparel. The executive club box, $75 for $125 worth of apparel. And the ball club season plans. That's the deal right there. That's $150 for three, uh, seven, uh, $75 boxes worth $125 each. That's $375 worth of stuff. That's $225 more than you pay. Ballclubbox.com. Go check it out. I'm telling you, they're the shiz. Also, do me a favor. Go check out Kobe's Corner. That's Kobe with a K. Corner with a K. Uh, I hope there's not another K. But go check out Kobe's Corner on YouTube. Uh, also, go check out Kobe'sCorner.com. That's two Ks. Um, I'm a writer for the site. Kobe did the intro. Good friend of mine. Great YouTube channel analysis breakdown of fights on, of course, articles by me and other MMA journalists, podcasters, whatnot. Kobe's Corner, man, go check it out. One of the fastest growing YouTube channels for MMA and one of the best online. Thanks for to hope you go and check out Kobe's Corner and Ball Club Box. But now let's get to this Eric Shelton interview and the Eric Shelton quick picks. I, I was going to save it for the School of Black Negro Jitsu, but I think this is too perfect for this card. He answered all the questions we need to know about what I think is one of the most important fights on the card. Um, so go ahead and uh, let's uh, let's let's tune into Eric Showtime Shelton and what I think is what will be on the GPP winning lineup, either him or Jerry Brooks. Eric Shelton, welcome to the MMA Edge Fantasy Podcast. Wonderful to have you on this week. Um, big fight with the monkey guy, Jared Brooks, this uh, Saturday at UFC 214. How are you feeling? How's your weight cut? How's everything going? I'm feeling great, man. Uh, training camp's been great. Back with my back with my coach, Pete Spratt. Um, uh, Weight cut's always smooth for me. hasn't been really been an issue throughout my career, so that's going good too, man. I'm I'm just feeling good, man. I'm ready for this fight, man. I'm ready to shut this kid up. That's what's up. Mm, we all know where you're at right now. You a tough semifinalist. You just took a super close loss to Alexandra Pantoja in your last fight. Um, but how did you get here? What's your journey? Tell our listeners a little bit about your background. I think you have a wrestling background, but how did you get into MMA? Go ahead and refresh people about how you got here. Well, yeah, man. Uh, I, I never really uh, – I never wrestled throughout high school. I never did any of that. Um, 
it was just pretty much in med a little boxing uh when i was like 14 to like like a year maybe of boxing um but i went and ended up going to uh checking out an mma gym with a buddy of mine that i went to school with uh, and i got beat up pretty good man so i just kind of fell in love with it and never left the gym stayed in there that was with my first team uh over there in galesburg illinois it was a, a wolf pack was the name of it osc and uh so yeah yeah what, what city in Illinois? Because uh, my roommate, uh, he, he trains the American top team, EJ Brooks. He coaches over Granite City. Um, yeah, what city in Illinois? Uh, Galesburg, Illinois. What the hell is that? E- east or West of Illinois? Uh, I'm not. I'm not really sure. It's like it's like three hours from Chicago, like an hour from Peoria. So it's it's not too far. I don't know exactly where's your where your friends from, but oh, it's a Granite small city. little town. Granite City. Granite City. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, it's like, uh, it's just a small little town, man, not, not big at all. <laughs> okay, all right, go ahead and continue. You said you don't have any amateur-specific background in your past, but why is your wrestling, your game so wrestling-specific? It seems strong, too. How did your wrestling game get so strong? How did it develop? Uh, tell us a little bit about your wrestling game. Yeah, man, I just... Uh... I don't know. I took fast to the jujitsu part aspect of the of the sport, man. Uh, that was kind of my first first gym was jujitsu based uh, with Bo Admire as the head coach. Um, man, I just I I was always I'm always wrestled a lot like with my family. You know, me and my my dad would wrestle a lot when I was younger, but never really never competed in, in any any wrestling. Um, but yeah, man, I just I just took fast to the jujitsu aspect of it, and that was kind of my base. Um, then as I as I grew in my career, I, I went from my original team OSC uh, to Militage Fighting Systems over there in Iowa, uh, and man, I just I was training with a lot of great wrestlers down there. You know, Iowa's a big wrestling state, so I trained a lot of great wrestlers there. You know, and it just you know my my career just took off from there. I ended up down here in San Antonio with Pete Spratt and working my striking now and and getting everything down, man. I'm I'm just uh, I'm trying to be well rounded because you know I mean nowadays you can't just be one dimensional, so. It's just been it's just been a journey. You're exactly right, man. Um, you were on Tough Twenty Five, the Champions Edition, which was one of the best editions ever. Um, what organization were you the champion of coming into that uh, competition? You had a big upset over the number two seed, who I believe had a really strong Brazilian Jiu Jitsu background. I believe he was a BJJ black belt. Um, refresh us on that. Also, how did you like your experience? You lost to Tim Elliott, who went on to give Demetrius Johnson hell in a majority decision, which I guess one person gave you a draw, one person gave you the fight. But give us a synopsis of your entire experience on Tough and your regrets or anything like that. The experience in the house was awesome, man. It was season 24. Uh, I was the champion of, of Cage Aggression. It's a promotion based out of Iowa. I feel the best promotion in that area. Um, so, yeah, when I got on the show, they, they seated me the 15 seed. Um, and I was a little upset about that in the beginning, something that, you know, I felt like I was going to be ranked higher. I had a, a good record going in. I had fought a lot of guys. I actually beat a guy that was a, a contestant on the show um, or was going to be on the show, but didn't end up making it. But so, yeah, I mean, I just felt like I was going to be higher seed. But when uh, I found out I was the 15 seed or something, I just had to adapt to, you know, I kind of used it to my advantage, you know. Um, a lot of guys were underestimating me, and I'm used to being the underdog. So, yeah, my first fight was against Yoni Sherbatov. He's actually, uh, he had a good, he had a wrestling background and um, he had a, he has his own gym, owned his own gym for 10 years. So he was a good, good undefeated fighter too. Um, yeah, he was he was a stud, and everybody had him winning the show. To be honest with you, though, he was they had everybody was saying he would be the dark horse just before we we figured the seeds out. And then uh, I found out I matched up against him, and and I'm not gonna lie, I was nervous for the fight because we everybody was talking this kid up like he he was gonna be the one. And um, yeah, that fight ended up going my way. And then uh, my next fight, I fought uh, Ronaldo Candido, which was uh, Jose Aldo's jiu-jitsu coach at the time. He was the the black belt that I that I faced. And uh, okay. That's yeah. Who I was thinking of. Yep. And uh yeah, he was a he was a stud too, man. Um but I ended up getting that fight as well. And yeah, the Tim Elliott fight, man, it was a I had trained with him throughout that. He was on my team, obviously. Um so I had trained with them throughout that 
throughout the camp. So I kind of had an idea of what he does, and he had an idea of what I did too. Um, yeah, the fight was back and forth. Uh, when I look back on the fight, I, I feel like it, it could have went either way. I feel like we definitely should have won a third round. But again, everything happens for a reason. Um, I don't dwell on the past. I like to have short-term memory with, with stuff like that. So, yeah, I'm a, he, he was the guy to win it. He ended up being the guy to win it. So, And he was taking the guys out that he fought in the first round. So he, he was a veteran, though. You know, he had already been in the UFC. He had already, you know, done it. So, you know, everything happens for a reason again. And I was, you know, I was blessed to be a part of that and blessed to be able to meet the people I met, you know, met, uh, got a lot of connections with coaches as well as fighters. So, yeah, man, this everything I feel like played out right. And now, now I'm catching, got myself here at uh, UFC 214 fighting with alongside a whole bunch of great fighters, you know, and, you know, I'm, ex I'm extremely excited. That's awesome, man. But going from Tim Elliott, let's get into two. 14 fight week that's where we are right now it's one of my first times getting a fighter during fight week how you think your previous experience with elite grapplers is going to prepare you for jared brooks in this spot because i don't know if you want those guys to watch film but basically all jared brooks does is grapple i wouldn't necessarily call him elite but in my opinion if he can't take you down and grind you out he can't win Alexander Pan Soldier was able to do a bit of that at times, take you down and whatnot. But how do you feel about going into a fight against another grappler after a fight where you got out grappled in some spots? But do you think the Pantoja fight prepared you for this fight well? Seeing as though he's a better grappler, in my opinion. You know, I'm excited. I feel like it's a good matchup for me. Um, I feel like I've faced a lot of guys like him, you know, a lot of wrestlers, and I've dealt with this before. So it's something that I'm I'm well prepared for. And, again, I have my coach, Pete Spratt, who's dealt with the same thing as well. He was a great striker and had to worry about getting taken down throughout his career too. So it's just something that we prepared for. And, uh, and yeah, like you said, man, I feel like that's the thing that he will – have on have is is his grappling like I said I, I have a jiu-jitsu base and I'm and I'm a, I'm a good wrestler as well so you know I'll be able to I think I'll be able to to deal with that and I'm excited man I just think that if he if he can't get me down like you said it, it it'll, it'll be a a long night for him and um yeah the preparation with the show and and all the guys I fought on the show I think is definitely you know those are all world class fighters, and I was able to train with those guys. I was able to see where I match up with everybody, you know, and it's something that I take pride in, and and I, I feel I did really well against everybody. So, and these are guys that you know, like I said, you know, Bren, uh, Ronaldo's a black belt in jujitsu, winning worlds and stuff like that. And and Yoni, he, I feel like Jared Brooks wouldn't be able to match up well with Yoni. These are all guys that you know are you know got good resumes, that fought tough guys. And again, Jared Brooks, he's he's a, you know not taking anything from him, but I don't feel he has faced anybody at that caliber yet. So I think it's gonna I think it's gonna definitely show in our in our fight. Okay, yeah, and, 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 and Jared talks a lot of trash. I'm supposed to have him actually on my podcast. I don't know what happened with that, but he's uh, he's uh, been encouraging people this week. I don't know if you you saw it on Twitter, but he's uh, he's encouraging people to go out put out memes about you. He talks a lot of crap. He's really disrespecting me. How do you feel about it if you even paid attention to it? Jared is a very, uh, he's probably going to give you some problems at the weigh-ins, probably going to push on you, you know. How, are you prepared for the mind games that Jared Brooks is going to be playing or is playing at this point? Yeah, man, I'm I'm prepared for that. You know, this this is just this is what I do. You know, I I fight, and it, you know, all that trash talking and all that stuff doesn't mean nothing to me because we still have to fight at the end of the day. You know, the fans can't they can't they can't get in there with you. you know, all those memes and all that crap it doesn't do anything. You know, it doesn't change that that we're gonna have to fight on July 29th. So. It's just going to make it worse for him, I think. You know, I've never had uh, someone disrespect me like this, and he's kind of making it more personal than anything. So, yeah, man, it, it just made me more hungry. than You know, my training has been more intense. I've been just working a lot harder now because he's he's made it personal. You know, most of the most fighters I try to respect, and I, I still respect him. It's not taking anything from the guy. You know, obviously he's, he's trying to market himself, and this is how he wants to be. Everybody wants to be the next Conor McGregor, it seems. So I'm a... Uh, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get sucked into the games. You know, I'm, I'm out here to do what I do. You know, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to perform the way I perform on the show and the way I perform and, you know, every fight, you know, it's a, it's going to be a fun fight. You know, I think he has a, 
I think he's putting more pressure on himself saying all that stuff, you know, saying he's going to run through me and beat me in the first round because it's not going to happen. You know, I'm, I haven't been finished in my whole career and he's against world-class fighters and I'm not going to let Jared Brooks be the guy to do it, especially after all the trash he's talked. So he's, uh, he's in for a long night, man. I think, um, I think the trash talking is going to put, put an edge in, in my favor, to be honest with you, because I'm coming to fight. I'm not going to not show up. You know, I know he had his first fight with Ian McCall and, and that didn't end up going through. So I'm here, you know, and I'm, I'm not going anywhere. So he's going to have to, he's going to have to eat his words. Okay, all right. Well, now, what are some of your favorite foods? Some of the things you've been missing out on during this fight camp. Um, some of your cravings. Are you one of those guys that cuts a lot of weight? Um, what are some of the things you're craving? Or are you even thinking about it right now? Uh, tell me what's on your mind as far as food is concerned. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, man, the cut, weight cut's never an issue for me, man. Um, and the, the show helped me a lot with that as well, man. I had to cut weight every week, you know, three times in a row. So I never, I, you know, it got my discipline up a lot. Um, I mean, uh, I love, I love like carbs. I love to eat pastas and, and stuff like that, you know, Italian food and, and uh, you know, things like that. So after my weigh-in, I'm definitely going to be carbon up. But uh, yeah, right now I'm just you know that i'm just so focused on my fight it's not even it's not even crossed my mind i don't really have to you know deplete myself throughout throughout my weight cut because you know i don't really walk that heavy i usually watch well, at the most you know when i'm not training like super hard i'm walking like 138 140 possibly you know so it's never really a hard a cut for me and in training camp usually like 35 so it's just uh it's been smooth man it's throughout my career weight cuts never been an issue so I'm just uh, trying to be disciplined, focus on on the fight, you know, and and let and let this kid, you know, pump it up. You know, that's all he's doing right now is he's he's bringing he's putting an eye on us, and and that's cool with me. You know, I'm, you know, I'm cool with that. You know, because everybody's gonna be paying attention now because he said so much, he's talked so much, and he's called out half the division already, and hasn't even had a one fight in the UFC. So uh, it's obvious to me that he he uh, that he did he just has no respect for 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 the division and what other people do and. Um, so yeah, man, I'm, I'm just excited. And like I said, man, the weight cut's not an issue. So after my weight, uh, weigh ends, I'll be, I'll be definitely carving up though. <laughs> That's what's up. That's what's up. Uh, so Pete Spratt's camp, um, you said you've been, uh, working on your striking mostly down there, but do they have any high level wrestlers down there for you to go with? Is it a big camp or small camp? Uh, um, you know, a lot of black belts in there. The school is uh, Rodrigo um, Panera. <laughs> he's a he's a world champ too. You know, jujitsu, ton ton of uh, talent in the gym why, as far as that goes. When you, you said that name, uh, is he a colorful personality? And no, I laugh because I did a uh, interview with that, and uh, I never can get his last name right. My Pinero. My coach is over here, and he's a. Uh, I did an interview with that. And I actually had like a blooper, a blooper scene. We're trying to say his last name. I can never get it right, so that's that's the only reason I laugh. But yeah, man, he's a he's a stud, man. I I don't think anybody in the world can mess with him in jujitsu. Um, and then again, I got great wrestlers in there. You know, I got Alec in there. I got tons of good wrestlers that've been pushing me. You know, and I've been putting myself in positions. You know, my coach has been every minute new fresh guy coming in, and I'm in a bad position, and I gotta go. You know, so I'm just. I've been working nonstop, man. Um, you know, striking is, is something I feel that I that I'm good at already. So I have been working a lot of wrestling, a lot of grappling, and a lot of bad uh, uh, positional things as well. So, you know, this camp has been super good for me, you know, and it's been focused on me. So, I think I'm I'm more than prepared. All right, guys, let's get right into this card. UFC 214. We got three championship fights. We've got, if I'm not mistaken. We've got about 12 fights, so we got a stacked lineup for this card. First fight up on the night is going to be Josh Berkman versus Drew Dober in a fight that I just feel like saying no to. I just do. Um, not very appealing to me at all. Josh Berkman is uh, coming into this fight priced at $7,200, while Drew Dober is going to be priced at $9,000. Josh Berkman is appealing to me in GPPs. 
he's appealing to me in cash because I think this goes to a decision for sure. He should at least score like more so in cash. He should at least score like 30 points. And I think he can get the win against Drew Dober. There's no Drew Dober has no business being priced at $9,000. That's absolutely heinous. That being said, um, Josh Berkman frees up everything in cash. Um, he frees up, uh, he, he could win, so he could be, he's a GPP sleeper. Uh, Drew, Josh Berkman is the only guy I'm thinking about playing this week in any format. Um, Beast Mo Cal, what do you think? Uh, the fight should, should play out majority in the clinch, so based on that, uh, Dober, Dober should win the fight. If it's gonna play out in the clinch, because uh, we've seen in, in, in Berkman's last few fights, he he gets dominated in the clinch, um, and he gets taken down in the clinch, and you know, Dober Dober likes to sneak in some takedowns here and there. But uh, uh, I think I honestly do think Dober should win this fight fairly easily, but there's no chance for a high score just because of his price tag is gonna be hard to pay off, and um, but but. Here's an interesting fact. Dober Dober dropped his last two opponents, which were both southpaws. This is his third straight southpaw he's facing. So uh, this, this this could actually be a finish for Dober as well. And I, I don't know. I, I really don't know what to think of this because uh, Berkman hasn't faced a southpaw in a while, but he lost to both of them and got outstruck by both of them. That was early in his career when he was actually, you know, Sharp now, he I feel like he's on his way out. So, um, as far as in, in the GPP perspective, both men are in play, but you should lean more towards Dover just because he'll be the lower owned out of the, the 9k guys. But, um, don't, don't, don't be, don't be surprised if he doesn't score high. Eric F, what's your verdict on this fight? I don't know, I don't know. I think Dauber wins the fight. I just don't like the salaries in here at all. Um, I think if Berkman wins, I think it's more going to be like he's going to lay on top of him, you know, kind of just keep him contained on the ground. So I don't see him scoring a lot of points either. So, I mean, I might have a sprinkle of him. I would definitely have more of Dauber. I just don't know how much I'm going to. I just hate his salary. Okay, and CG3 Analytics, what do the numbers say? So the metrics favor Dauber, but not by much. Um I like Dover strictly in cash because I don't think he's going to finish Berkman. But at 9,000, there's just a lot of guys I like better, so I won't have much exposure to him. Um, so far in the UFC, Dover has three wins and five losses. So I just don't think he should ever be 9,000. And, you know, Berkman is tough. I think he can make it all three rounds, like you said. So he doesn't need to score a whole lot to uh, at 7,300 to make value. So I like Berkman in cash. Okay, that that's my thing too. I like Josh Berkman in the cash game. Um, I like him even for GBPs. Huh? Does, does it not scare you that that Berkman? You know, he likes to circle around on the outside, uh, which which automatically low. leads to clinches. He's like, I think he's like really he's behind low, the black tape the whole me. time. What was that? That's, that's fine. I, I think he's I think I think Berkman seventy two hundred dollars against Drew Dober. He's low output. I still don't like him. I think he's too low output. And remember, Dober Dober won't have to deal with uh, BJJ Wizards like uh, Santos and and OAM. So I feel like this is a piece of cake. This should be a sure win for Dober, but I just don't know about the points. Everything adds up for Dober, for Dober pretty much. It should go to decision. I'm not sure what Vegas is saying, but it should go to decision. The odds should be high on that. So Josh Berkman is the only guy I'm considering. Dober, I know, no way. Dober's um, price, Dober's at like minus three fifty. The last I saw, which I still think, I still think that's too way big of a favorite for him. But whatever. All right, I don't Kayla think he Kray should be that big. Kaylee Coran versus Alexandra Albu at 115 pounds. We've got Kaylee Coran coming in here at um uh, um. $7,900, while Alexandra Albu is going to be coming in at $8,300. I don't like this fight too much, but if I'm playing somebody, it's Kaylin Coran. I think she's the only one that's got a decent like scoring potential on this one. I think she's got good wrestling. She's got good striking. She's just young, 
and irresponsible. Like her losses to Paige Van Zandt and Alex Chambers were her fault. Um, her losses to Felice Herrig. Felice Herrig is just a re- better grappler than her. And then she took a loss to, um, oh girl, um, I'm forgetting her name, Jamie Moyle. And that was another wrestle heavy matchup where I don't know what she was doing. We can't trust any uh Kaylin Cram, but I like her price and this is a fight. I didn't like what I saw from Al Boulas fight as far as her striking. She's a judo black belt, but yeah, uh Kaylin Cran is a GPP consideration only um lightly. Eric F, what do you think? Um, I'm actually on a different side than you are. I don't Necessarily think Koran's got necessarily the best fight IQ. Um, I kind of like Abu for uh, in general. I, I think she's got higher upside. I think she's the better striker. She's shown that she has decent uh, submission game. I I actually like her better in GPPs. I don't know about cash, but I like her better in tournaments. Okay. Uh, Beast Mo Cal. I like I I actually like Kaylin Coran here, but I, I'm I'm gonna personally stay away from this fight. But I feel like she would have the advantage grappling just because she's had so much grappling time in the UFC so far. Uh, every everyone every one of her her contests were decided uh, on the ground, so she's had so much experience. And Alexandra has two years off since her last fight, so Kaylin should have the advantage, the experience. And everything, but I'm I'm not I'm not gonna put my money on Kaylin just because she's let me down already before. Okay, and that's a great point about experience. This is only Albu's third professional fight. That's another thing I'm worried about. CG3 Analytics, what the numbers say? So Albu lands almost five strikes per minute, and and Quran absorbs more strikes per minute, over four strikes per minute, and she only lands about three point four strikes. So. She takes a lot of damage, and like Eric said, I don't think she has a high fight IQ, and I don't like Karan at all. Um, she lost uh, four of her last fight, four of her last five fights, and in three of those fights, she was finished. So I know she has that good wrestling upside, but I can picture her going in for a takedown and getting caught in a guillotine or something. And yeah, I think Albu can finish this fight, and I like her in cash and GPP. I won't have any exposure to Karan. Okay, um, I don't blame you for that, but let's get on to our next fight. Jared Brooks versus Eric Shelton, who I just got talk, done talking with a minute ago at 125 pounds. Eric Shelton is going to be coming into this fight at $7,600, while our guy um, Jared Brooks, the monkey god, he's going to be costing us $8,600 this weekend and i absolutely think this is a key fight if jared brooks can have his way he's going to score a million points if eric shelton can have his way he's going to score great for his price um i'm assuming people will be higher on on jared brooks because of his wrestling because of his aggression but i just got done talking to shelton and shelton knows what he's facing and he's been preparing for it as a matter of fact he told me and you if you listen to the interview which we just played uh he's more focused on his wrestling for this camp than anything else so uh he's faced tim elliott in the past he faced some black belts on tough he faced pantosia in his last matchup i think he knows what he needs to do in this matchup i'm favoring shelton but I can't leave Jerry Brooks out of the equation because of if he wins, like I said, he should score awesome. So uh, I'm favoring Shelton for this matchup. I don't. I think this is a no go in cash at this point for me. Maybe Shelton is my consideration if I do do that. Eric F, what do you think? Um, I don't know about this game or about this uh, fight for cash, but for tournaments, I actually like Shelton a little bit more. He's in the past shown he's good take. He's got good takedown defense. Um, so if he can shut down Brooks from the takedowns and stuff, I could see Shelton scoring very good in this. Um, I'll have exposure to both, but I'll probably have more exposure to Shelton. Beast Mokel. Well, well Shelton, Shelton has been surviving those grappling exchanges uh, on the ground with uh, Yoni, Pantoja, Tim Elliott. He has been finding himself on his back a lot. So he's getting taken down by these um, 
Brazilian jiu-jitsu wizards, but surviving. Nonetheless, he's getting taken down. And uh, Jared Brooks, that's his bread and butter. He's going to take you down. He's going to be aggressive. He's in your face. Grappling heavy style. He's gonna he's gonna he's gonna look to take him down. And like you said, uh that's a key component in DraftKings. And this weekend, uh he, he can score a whole bunch of points. And a lot of people are gonna be thrown off by his UFC debut. But uh he's actually been through this. He's been through the whole process up until the fight. So the jitters won't be there as much as they were uh his first fight before it got cancelled. So I feel like that's something to to to, to look into. Not only that, I, he has more experience as well because of his extensive uh, amateur career. He's had almost 13 title defenses or titles in amateur competition. And I know it's amateur, but he's been in the octagon 13 times more than uh, Eric Shelton has. So that's my take on that. Okay, CG3 Analytics, what do the numbers say? So Eric Shelton scored four takedowns against Pantoja in his first UFC fight. You know, everyone's talking about Brooks's wrestling, but, you know, Shelton obviously has that takedown upside as well. And I know he lost that fight against Pantoja, but he proved that he can take a top 15 flyweight to a close split decision. So I just like his price better at 7,600. I don't mind Shelton in cash or GPP. And at 8,600, there's just more guys at that range that I like better than Brooks. I don't know if Brooks is going to win the fight, so... I don't want to spend up on him. I, I think he does have the takedown upside, so I would I would take a gamble on him in cash, but I don't want to touch him in GPP because I don't think he's going to finish Shelton. Okay. On to our next fight, Andre Philly versus Calvin Qatar at 145 pounds. And uh, in my estimation, this uh, this is, should be a blowout. Andre Philly is $9,200. Calvin Qatar is seven thousand dollars i wasn't very impressed with him on film he's only fought like three or four times in the last four or five years hadn't been super active i think this is a layup spot for andre feely uh i think he's a great candidate to finish inside the distance because the quality of his opponent that's about all i know because i don't know where calvin guitar is there's not much film or anything on him maybe he could look like a world beater or something but i can't know at this point Andre Philly is a cash game consideration. He's a GPP consideration. He's a great pivot off people like Cyborg and other folks. Eric F., what do you think about this fight? I actually like this fight a lot. I don't know if I'm going to use Qatar at all. The only thing that kind of makes me hesitant of going all in on Philly is if I remember looking up stuff, I think Qatar is harder to put away. I don't think he gets finished necessarily quickly. Um so you have to worry about upside, but I like him a lot. I I like Philly a lot in cash, um, just because I think he's a I think he's a safe win. But I don't know how much exposure I'm going to have to him in tournaments. I'll have some. Um, there's a couple things I'm considering um, later on in this week as I'm looking into stuff about strategies I'm taking going into tournaments. So it just depends on what I do. Beast Cal. I don't know much about uh, Calvin, but um, I, just for now, man, I, I feel like, you know, the Team Alpha Male product, Andre Feely, he's, he's around that good that, that good camp, those good fighters, the good training partners. I feel like they set it up perfectly for him. Uh, he, should, he should win this fight 100%, but as far as the finish, I don't know because the decision – the decision percentage between the guys are, are very it's very high. It's over it's about seventy five percent the decision. At least wins. Um but um for now is is a touchy feeling. He was preparing for Duho Choi as well. So it's kinda of like the downgrading competition. Okay. Um C G three analytics, what do you say? I think Feely's pretty safe in cash and GPP. I was looking at uh, Qatar's record, and this guy, he goes by the Boston finisher. That's his nickname. But he won his last six fights by decision. So if you can't finish anybody on the regional circuit, I don't think you're ready for the UFC. Uh, UFC. So um, I think he's more of a cash play, but I wouldn't mind him as a GPP either. I'm not going to touch Qatar at all. Okay. Yeah. And Lara. And I'm going to have to give a, if you want me to do a quick run through here, I got to get 
back to work. So I don't know if you just want to throw the fight yeah. at me, in my opinion. Uh, or Tega versus uh, Moicano. Um, I like Mori, uh, Moicano more. Um, he's got better better all around. Um, I think Ortega's worth a flyer in tournaments. Um, I don't know what I'm doing in cash for that. Burrell versus Aljamain Sterling. Uh, I don't know. I I kind of like Burrell a little bit for his price in this one. Um, I think I, I think he's worth a flyer in GPPs. I don't know what I'm doing for this in tournaments. I, I, I'm not sure how safe I think Sterling is in his cash or anything like that. Chase Knight versus Ricardo Lamas. I think this is a, I think this is a pretty decent fighter. I think this is something you need to target in tournaments. I kind of want shares of both. Jimmy Manua versus Vulcan Ozdemir. I really like um, Manua. I like him a lot in cash. Um, I think. Um, Ozdemir is going to have because you know what he's been doing lately. I think a lot of people are going to be on him, so I think that might lower Manoa's um, ownership. And and I like him a lot in tournaments too. Robbie Lawler versus Donald Cerrone. I think it depends on what Lawler's strategy is in here. If he can attack Cerrone, you know, with like leg kicks, attacks to the body, we've seen how that damages Cerrone. Um, I like Lawler a little bit more if that's the game plan he's going to use. Um, but I kind of want some exposure to Cerrone, too. Cyborg versus Avenger. Cy Cyborg is pretty much a lock to win. I just don't know what her upside is for her price. I don't think she's finishing in the first round. Um, Avenger has shown that she's a good wrestler in Invicta. So if for some, I mean, if she can how take Cyborg down, I think it becomes an interesting fight. It's just a matter of can she get her down. My versus Woodley. Um, I like Woodley a lot. Um, I think um, the reason beyond Maya that he's going to be able to take his back and stuff, and I think Woodley's too strong for that. Um, he's got way more upside uh, with his power and everything. Um, I, I like Woodley in all formats. Cormier versus Jones. I like Jones. Um, I think Jones is going to win. He's got the longer reach, um, way better upside. Only thing that t makes me hesitant with him is this fight's going to be super high owned. Um, so I think I like I like Jones in cash. I just don't know if I'm going to use him in tournaments a lot just because of his ownership. I think that's kind of a leverage play to not use him just because I could see it potentially being not as high scoring as people think it's going to be. Okay, Eric. That's it. All right. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Let's go on to the next fight. Brian Ortega. Versus Moicano Cornero at 145 pounds. We got T City coming in at $8,000 here. Moicano, $8,200. I think that, um, I think Moicano should win this fight because he's a better technical striker. But Brian Ortega always finds a way to pull it out in the third round. Now he's facing another Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt here, so maybe not. Because on paper, I mean, Moicano is the better striker, and they both just you just you should cancel each other out. So, but I just believe in Ortega in the third round. It just keeps happening, kind of consistently throughout his career. Um, yeah. So, but it's like almost priced even. I would just I wouldn't want to be the guy that took this fight and then it's maybe not even that key of a fight to even play even because. Either Ortega is going to, like, win late or Moicano is going to control it with his strike. I mean, he outstruck Jeremy Stevens, which was super impressive. So, I'm picking Moicano. I probably should settle on him, maybe have a few Ortega hedges. But, Beast Mocal, how do you feel? See, I have a strong take on this one. Uh, this is, like, this is a Paul Craig situation where the submissions rack up for one guy. But that guy can't seem to get it on the ground himself. Um, Ortega Ortega just seems more interested in striking than his his bread and butter, which is the grappling. And I know that's true because uh, there was one fight in this corner. Uh, the third round came, man. He told him, "Hey, you lost the first two. Let's get to, let's get this on the ground now." So that's his game plan. His game plan is to strike until he's uncomfortable, then take the fight down. 
And I feel like he's gonna it's gonna happen against Moicano. Moicano, his hands has improved so much from fight to fight that uh, it, re- it really stood out to me. His hand speed, his striking in general, just just improved so much. And and he can hang on the mats as well with Ortega. Uh, he has long limbs. He can he can pull off some crazy stuff as well. Uh, and his ability to not gas in the third in the third round, uh, like. Um, Tavares, Tavares was the one who, who gassed out against Ortega, and he and um, he was actually losing the fight against Clay until he just ran into a, a flying knee. So he's due, he's due to. I don't want to say, I don't want to say it like that, but he's due to lose. Uh, he just hasn't been impressive his uh, his fights in the UFC. So Moicano is one of my top plays at his price range. Okay, um, yeah, it just scares me when somebody just, it's like he's the third round is his, man, like it belongs to him, that's the only thing that's making me hesitant on that one, otherwise, technically, I think more kind of should win, oh, CG3 Analytics, what the numbers say? No, I agree with your breakdown, Lara, I think, uh, this is a fight that is extremely tough to call, the metrics favor Moicano, he lands over four strikes per minute, superior stand-up. But he's more of a cash play for me because I don't I can't see him finishing Ortega. <clears throat> but Ortega's actually my preferred play. He has sneaky striking, great knees, crafty submissions, and he's coming off three consecutive finishes, which makes him a viable option in cash and GPP. So I like Ortega a little bit more, but I do think Mocano is a better cash option. Ortega more in GPPs. Okay, let's get on to the next fight at 140 pound, like catch weight or something like that. I don't know what's up with this 140 pounds, but we got Henning Burrell versus Aljamain Sterling. Oh, uh, Henning Burrell is going to be coming in at $7,800, while Aljamain Sterling is going to be coming in here at $8,400. I, uh, hmm, I don't know what to do. I'm gonna have to watch some more film on this, but Henning Burrell is undoubtedly the more appealing play in this spot. I think Aljamain Sterling should take it. He's he's had some tough matchups there with, uh, um, oh boy, um, Rafael Asuncao, Brian Caraway. I don't know if Hen- Henan Burrell used to be the shiz. He beat Augusto Mendez. That was about right. Um, I don't think Henan Burrell was at once arguably the pound for pound greatest fighter in the world. He has all the tools to win this, but I just feel like Aljamain Sterling should at this point in Burrell's career. He's got the wrestling. His striking is quirky but improving, um, but I favor him and Burrell's to play because he'll be more key to winning a GPP. Aljamain Sterling doesn't have that much upside to me. I mean, how much he, he only averages 70.4 DraftKings points per game. Um... <coughs> The only time that he was really a key play was against uh, – he got it against Johnny Eduardo. And uh, he managed to be a key play against um, uh, Viana. But now I, I just – I really don't see it. So, yeah, Burrell is a person I like to play, I think. But uh, Beast Mocal, what do you think? I'm not interested in this fight much at all. Uh, if if anyone is Burrell, but as far as fights with Aljamain Sterling in it, he just doesn't seem to want to fight. Uh, he's he's always on the horse. He's you look at his absorb per minute. Uh, a lot of that is credited to just him dancing around, just you know hitting and running. And that's not sure that's good to win, but it's not very uh, attractive in GPPs or TK in general. So. I'm going to be staying away from this fight, but if I had to pick, I feel like uh, Henning Burrell has got himself together. So I feel like he's going to, he's going to, he's back on it. So I feel like he shouldn't, he has a chance to win this fight. Okay. CG3 Analytics, what did the numbers say? I agree with CJ on this one. The metrics on this fight are super close. They both land around 3.5 strikes. Uh, Sterling has good. Wrestling, but Burrell is 97% takedown defense. So um, I think it's going to be a stand up fight, which is going to favor Burrell. Plus, Burrell is cheaper. So this is strictly a cash play for me. And I think 
Barrow being cheaper has better value, but I think for the most part, I'm going to fade this fight. Man, so Dillashaw and these other guys, they didn't even take him down that much. Okay. So that's interesting. I'm going to have to look at the film on that one. Yeah, Barrow is the person I'm favoring right now, but I can't say how I'm going to go at the end of the day. Next fight up at 145 pounds, Jason Knight versus Ricardo Lamas. It's an $8,100 fight. You know, my rule of his price to even, you better play it even at least once. But I'm liking Jason Knight. Jason Knight is on a roll. When you take Jason Knight down, you get caught in that vicious rubber guard. And um, I'm, I'm feeling like riding the Jason Knight train, man. He's hot. He seems unstoppable. Um, he's passing test grappling test that uh i like he passed a good striking test with alex caceres what is ricardo lamas offer here that's so interesting i, I like jason Knight's aggression i like uh the fact that when he gets taken down he neutralizes his opponent's offense and lands his own and threatens with submissions jason knight is one of my favorite plays on the board right now maybe that's stupid i don't know beast mo cal what do you think uh does this in a sense, Caceres has the same approach as Lamas does in terms of the kicks. And we saw, we saw Jason Knight just completely shut that kicking game down against uh, Caceres. And, you know, I, I see I see Knight catching and countering those kicks, uh, finding a way into a body lock and, like, you know, catching a kick and finding his way into a body lock and taking Lamas down. Lamas has been uncomfortable on the ground, at least against um, Oliveira, his last fight. And uh, he was actually running into some, you know, bad transitions with Diego Sanchez. But um, I feel like I feel like Knight will have an answer to everything he does. And almost just doesn't change. He fights the same way. All those spinning kicks and Knight, Knight, Knight has an answer to that. He can score points anywhere on the feet, striking, takedowns, passes, whatever it is. And, I, you know, he's treating me good so far, so there's no reason for me to not, to, you know, to fade him. So I really like Knight here. What's your, what's your exposure right now? Are you all in on Knight or are you like, how are you feel? I mean, I'm not all in on Knight because of, the, you know, that, that narrative that, is, you know, it's a veteran versus, I wouldn't say rookie because uh, Knight, Knight has some, has some, some minutes in the octagon already, but you know you can certainly play that narrative where the number three is like, nah, chill out, number fifteen. You ain't you ain't coming to my territory. But um, I'm not gonna have any llamas because I don't. I just don't see him knocking Jason Knight out, and also don't see him out grappling him. But I will be, you know, I'm I'm at least halfway in right now on night. Okay, CG three analytics. What the numbers say. This is a tough fight to call. Knight is an excellent prospect and strikes at a higher rate, but his takedown defense is suspect at 54%, and Lamas has that wrestling pedigree, so that's his path to victory. He can score the takedowns, but <clears throat> for that reason, I only like that Lamas and cash. That rubber but guard. See, that, yeah, yeah. Exactly. the stats don't say that. The stats don't yeah. take that into effect. Yeah, exactly. So I, I liked Lamas more at first, but now I'm starting to lean more towards Knight. And if, if the fight's standing... Um, Lamas has been TKO'd three times. So three out of his five losses were by TKO. Knight, it seems like his striking improves every fight. So I think I'll have exposure to him in cash and GPP because I think he has more finishing upside. Not only that, man, the, the, uh, the camp, the, uh, his camp is very good at selecting shots. They found, um, they found this one shot that will land on Chas Kelly. And Jason Knight just, you know, waited and waited and, and, and found the opportunity to, to land that strike. So his camp is good in terms of finding what shots are open for his opponent. And like you said, Ricardo Lomas has been knocked out three times already. So that, that, that that's a possibility right there. Right. I think Knight, on his back. Too. Knight posted a picture on Twitter where he's eating a steak and French fries. <laughs> Who did? Who did? Uh, Jason Knight did. Oh, God. Oh God. Hopefully he so, makes weight. doesn't fuck around. Right, I know. It's a little bit concerning, but uh, the kid's got so much potential, and he's a, he's a tough son of a bitch, man. He's not going to get finished. No, I, I like his mentality, though. Uh, half the battle did mention something about um, his mentality and his fight against Chaz Kelly. This dude's just focused, man. This is all he wants. So, yeah. 
you know, there's a hungry, hungry young lion taking over someone else's favela. Is is that what Connor said? Something like that. So, yeah, I got I got night man night. Nice to meet right. you. All right, let's go to Volk and Ozemir versus Jim Manua at 205 pounds. Um, Jim Manua is coming in here at $8,800. Wow, Volk and Ozemir is going to be $7,400. And I have been counting Ozemir out lately, but I don't think I can afford to do that anymore. This dude is upsetting top fighters. He upset Misha Serkinov. He upset Ovin St. Pro. Um, I feel like you have to, I don't even know if Vulcan is like going to get knocked out here. So I'm not really interested in Jimmy Manu. It's like Vulcan Ozdemir a bust for me at this point, because I don't think Vulcan Ozdemir is a pushover. I, I used to, but not anymore. Beast Mocal, what do you think? This is a uh, two pressure fighters going head to head. Which can mean that this fight will be contested in the clinch a lot. Now, you guys take take this information for what it's worth. This can play out one of two ways. If it hits the clinch, I'd give the advantage to Vulcan because Vulcan, you know, can take it to the ground where Jimmy's uncomfortable. But if it stays on the feet, Vulcan hasn't faced a true, pure striker like Jimmy Manuel. He's faced OSP and Misha Serkinov. He's not faced Jimmy Manuel. Or a striker like him. So if it stays on the feet, of course, Jimmy Manuel, I feel like, should win this fight. But uh, I feel like this is going to be played out in the clinch. And it can be a low-scoring fight. While everybody's on it, it's okay to fade it in a few lineups. Okay. And uh, CG3 Analytics, what do the numbers say? I have a very strong take on this fight. Ozemir lands 5.6 strikes per minute, but he also absorbs 5.5 strikes per minute. His striking defense is not good, and that's a recipe for disaster against Manoa. 88% of Manoa's wins are by KO, and I honestly see him getting another one on Saturday. Um, Manoa has the nastiest left hook in the UFC, and he has a 79-inch reach, too. So I, I just see him catching uh, Ozemir. He had an impressive win against OSP, but I, I really do believe that was a lucky punch against Serkinov. So I like Manawa and Cash and GPP, and I won't have any exposure at all to Ozemir. Okay, I, I'm really, I'm really hesitant, to Ozemir, man. He's been, he's been crushing my lineups lately, and uh, yeah, I'm me too. Tired of but he he gets hit a lot, and I don't think he can take it from Manawa. Uh, he shouldn't be able to, but what if he lands? I'm going to have some Ozdemir. That's all I know. Robbie Lawler versus Donald Cerrone at 170 pounds. Um, Robbie Lawler is going to be coming in here at $8,500. Donald Cerrone is going to be costing us oh, $7,700. I feel like locking Robbie Lawler in cash and GPPs at this price point. Donald Cerrone usually loses to fighters of this caliber. Uh, Matt Brown was about to take the damn fight from him. So, if Matt Brown is going to put a hurting on you. I think I, I'm not doing any MMA math, but Donald Cerrone usually does not beat champions. Robbie Lawler is that. Um, and he's rested now. That's scary. I, I really like Robbie Lawler. That's all I can say. I feel like just. Robbie Lawler, Robbie Lawler, Robbie Lawler. But because I feel like he's going to score at least like 80 points. Um, Beast Mocal, what do you say? Now, what happens if Cerrone takes him down? What do you think about that? Who has taken Robbie Lawler down? Uh, Johnny Hendricks has taken him down quite a few times. I know it's Johnny that's, Hendricks. That's but. Johnny Hendricks, man. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's juice Johnny Hendricks. That's like Johnny Hendricks on, on the juice, man. That's not even – come on now. But no one no one really tried to take him down. Like, I don't think Condit tried to. Let me check. No, Condit didn't. And Rory, Rory tried but failed. So 45% of Lawler's losses have come by submission. And yeah, 50%, that's what I'm saying. It's, and uh, 50 can go either way, man. of Rory's wins have come by submission. So it's a valid point. Yeah, I mean, you see, I, I 
I'm leaning towards Robbie just because I've been uh, I've watched uh, Cerrone's last few fights, and this and the, the the thing that comes to mind most is, damn, this dude is getting hit a lot. Like Masvidal, Masvidal was you know putting hands on him. Matt Brown was putting hands on him. I uh, remember Patrick Cote was putting hands on him before he got knocked out. He's just he's just getting hit. He's getting hit way too much. And against Robbie Lawler, if it stays if it stays standing. You know, Robbie Lawler has been in those wars, man. He he can he can he can take a punch, unless it's you know Tyrone Woodley's overhand right. I mean, who can't take that punch anyway? But um, this is a tough one to, to call just because you know we don't know where the fight's gonna go. We don't. Okay. I say this, the safest bet is just to, to just to hedge this fight too, man. This is gonna be a high scoring fight, I believe. I don't. I, I, when I see Cerrone versus Champion, I just plug the Champion. CG3 Analytics. What did the numbers say? So the metrics are very close in this fight in terms of strikes per minute. Lawler's three point five, and Cowboys just over four. Uh, I favor Lawler in this fight because Cowboy struggles against guys that bring a lot of pressure. You look at the Masvidal fight, RDA, Nate Diaz, and that's exactly what Lawler's going to do. He's going to have Cerrone moving back the entire fight. Um, they both have finishing upside. Uh, I could picture Lawler finishing Cerrone, or I could also picture Cerrone landing a head kick. So, like CJ said, I'm going to hedge this fight. I think it's more of a GPP play than tournament because anything can happen. It's going to be fireworks. I'm really looking forward to this fight. You mean so? GPP is this a fight? Yeah, yeah. No, I'd rather. Yeah, I'm sorry. Tournaments instead of cash. Yep. Is this a fight? You know, one should go all in on. on I don't think side? so. I want Robbie Lawler. No. That's uh, my don't, So you don't see you don't see a sure finish then? I think it's gonna end in finish. Yeah. I, I don't see it being a back and forth fight like uh you know Lawler and McDonald. I think I, th- I think well yeah, I think it's gonna end in finish. I, I don't know when, but uh, I can't see it going to decision. I I just feel like this is a bad matchup for Donald Cerrone. He's a hell of a fighter. But when he gets up against people with big power, don't have striking deficiencies or any notable deficiencies, it's like it's a tough man. Out for him. I say you hedge it and go at least at least eighty percent in on this fight. Just hedge it because if I'm Lawler wrong. wins, he's either he's either gonna land a bunch of strikes or put him away in the first round. Donald Cerrone, if he wins it, is gonna be on the ground. So you know he's gonna get some takedowns and some passes. So it's going to okay. be a high-scoring fight, I feel like. Let's go into the next fight. Cyborg versus um, Tanya Evinger. Cyborg is, of course, the most expensive fighter on the night at $9,600. Wow. Tanya Evinger is going to be coming in here at $6,600. I've got to watch more film of Evinger. But I believe she's more of a grappler than anything else. She's also a tough veteran, so I don't know about Cyborg's ability to finish within the first round, and I don't think Avenger is necessarily going to be a pushover. Um, Cyborg is big and strong and vicious. Um, I want, I feel like I want exposure just in case John Jones doesn't score big and Manua doesn't score big, but I think she's kind of unnecessary in GPP. He's probably more of a cash game thing. Beast Mo Cal, uh, what do you think? I mean, you know, I'm. I have my shares of, of Cyborg, but I, I'm not going to go too crazy in on her just because the, the masses know who she is. What about Evans? Oh, uh, uh, man, I don't, I don't like her. She she, she had trouble against that, that Yana chick. I forgot what her name was. Um, but, yeah, she had trouble with her. And if she has trouble with her, even though it was in the grappling department, uh, she will have trouble with um, Cyborg. Okay. CG3 Analytics, what did the numbers say? Yeah, Cyborg lands over eight strikes per minute. 88% of her wins are by TKO. I think she is an absolute sure thing. I know she's expensive, but I personally think that she's worth it in cash and GPPs. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm not going to have any exposure to Avenger at all. If uh, I mean, I guess I can picture people stacking the fight just for the cost savings, but that's not something that I'm going to do. I don't plan on having any exposure to Avenger, and yeah, Cyborg. 
But you think you think she'll pay off that nine six? Well, when you look at it, I, I feel like if you don't pick Cyborg, then the I'm gonna have the next best value in my opinion is John Jones at eighty nine hundred. Right, Andre, Andre Philly yeah. is great too, man. Andre, yeah. Andre as well, yeah. Yeah, I, I just don't feel like going all the way up there. I, I have to, I have to do. I usually don't start making my decisions till I've just re- completely reviewed it on about Friday. Then I start to be like, here's what I want to do. But, um, yeah, man, I, I cyborg just a tad too expensive for all these cracking fights to be on this card. I'd rather just try and get. I think it. I'm gonna have one GPP where I can have Eric Shelton and also Damian Maya. That's gonna leave me no. alone. What Damian Maya? I think Damian Maya is, I don't think he's a bad GPP pawn. I don't think he's going to win the fight, but if oh he gets with his back. Don't waste your well, beautiful. Dollars. That's a beautiful segue right there, so might as well just. <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, God. when's the last time you saw Woodley on his back, though? Like, Never. I haven't seen this man on his back. He has been taken down before because he has, yeah. like, a 90-something percent takedown. Yeah, he's 91% percent takedown defense. I, I think Woodley's going to win the fight, but, I mean – Woodley is eighty seven hundred dollars for your information. Damian Maya is coming in here at uh, seventy five hundred dollars. Go ahead, CG three analytics. Okay, yeah. So, uh, like I said, I think Woodley's going to win the fight. He's got ninety one percent takedown defense. I think Woodley is a terrible matchup for Maya. Woodley's methodical, but he does fight at a slower pace. But all it takes is that one punch. And I can picture Woodley getting the uh, the knockout. I like Wood- Woodley in cash and GPPs. But if Maya does get that takedown on Woodley and he can backpack him, there's always that chance that he can get the rear naked choke. And that's why I do not think Maya is a bad option in GPPs. I wouldn't touch Maya in cash here. Just a GPP pawn. Okay. Um, no, don't do that. Nobody waste their money. Now, I haven't given my opinion. Tyron Woodley is the best cash play on the board. He's going to win. It's just a matter of when and how highly he'll score. Uh, Woodley probably won't get any takedowns, but he should finish this one ITD. If he knock, just about knocked Wonder Boy out twice, Damian Maya should be going for a nap as much as I love him. Um, do not waste your money on Damian Maya, despite what CG3 says. No. <laughs> Damian Maya, I mean, Maya is eight dollars. He should not be on any lineup, cash or GPP. Listen to Maya has Stanford. been knocked out, and it was by Woodley's signature punch. It was a it was an overhand right that knocked Maya out cold. So it's there if one. It's there. It's there if he can stay on his feet. Uh, that overhand right will be there, but let's see if he can stay on his feet. Yeah, I think he does. I think it's just a matter of how highly he scores when he finishes, but I don't think he stays on the feet for five rounds and does not put, with his improved striking, it's in Wonderboy he's facing. He's facing Damian Maia. Wonderboy had that style to neutralize him. Damian Maia is not Wonderboy. Wonderboy is one of the best strikers in the world. Damian Maia isn't bad, but not bad isn't good enough to stay conscious versus Tyron Woodley these days, in my humble opinion. Um... Next up, though, let's get to the main event. That's a five-round fight. Oh, these are uh, Avenger versus Justino, Woodley versus Maya. These are five-round fights. And Cormier versus Jones. Five rounds. Um, I love John Jones at $8,900. Daniel Cormier is at $7,300. But I have some reservations as we get closer. Daniel Cormier has been studying and training for this fight for essentially two and a half years. That is ridiculous. If anybody could have a two and a half year camp and already fought somebody once, don't you think that they would be over prepared to fight the person again? And John Jones is a little rusty in that he hadn't fought in about two years. So we've got the fact that Cormier has been fighting. He's had about two years to prepare for John Jones. And um, John Jones is rusty. I'm kind of worried about my John Jones exposure. It's kind of. Sort of in a way. Uh, he's working his wrestling. Everything that he failed in the first fight, he's working on it. He brought in a guy, this kickboxer, that looks just like John Jones. I saw it on the countdown. This is scary. Daniel Cormier is obsessed. Uh, I think he could keep this fight close the whole way. Closer than it was the first time for sure. 
Beast Mode Cal, what do you think? I, I, I feel like plugging John Jones in every lineup, but then I say, what if Cormier pulls it off? I feel like stacking this fight definitely in cash. Go ahead, Beast Mode Cal. I have two point of views on this fight. The first one is, let's look let's look at the the um the recent fights after John Jones his, his last John Jones fight. Uh, the first fight against Anthony Johnson and deep 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 shit. But uh, Johnson, you know, gassed out. He ended up picking up the win. Okay, cool. Uh, the fight against Alexander Gustafson that that fight could could have literally went either way. He could have scored it either way. I honestly had Alexander winning that fight. Um, the fight against Anderson Silva, what was it like? Two days notice, and uh, that—that's you know, he hasn't had a real fight since Alexander Gustafson. That's what I'm trying to say. His last fight against Anthony Johnson. Anthony Johnson was retired before he even came in the octagon. So, where is his level of competition at? Truly, just because he hasn't really faced. You know, competition in two years. You can say the same for John Jones. So that pretty much evens out. But from a technical st- standpoint, uh, Cormier has to get inside and get to take John Jones down. And everyone knows about John Jones's uh, dirty boxing and his clinch game. Those elbows are disgusting. Uh, you know, Cormier had trouble with it his last fight. And I honestly I just don't see him, you know, implementing his game plan on John Jones. I don't. I really don't. John Jones, his camp. He, he's fighting out Jackson Wink, which is one of the best gyms. And I feel like they, they're just super prepared for this fight because, like you said about Cormier, over-prepared about John Jones, he's had other fights that he has to prepare for. John Jones hasn't. So all those years, uh, he's been preparing for Cormier himself all, all, all that time on, on, on the shelf. So this one's a tough one, but I, I think I might go John Jones. I might go all in. Or I might go, you know, John Jones, but no Cormier at all. But um, we'll see. Let's see how how weigh-ins look. CG three and and plus Daniel Cormier is getting old, man. He's he's got gray in his fucking beard, man. He he can't be. Man, insane. if I see him coming shredded, if I see him coming shredded, like shredded as fuck, then I know he's serious. But if I see him, you know, weighing two hundred and six point two pounds again, then I don't know about all. Looking about like Carl Winslow. Yeah, he's starting to have trouble with his cuts. <laughs> man. You know, he's always had trouble with his cuts since the Olympics, though. So that's just a Daniel Cole. But, but he's getting older now. CG3 Analytics, what the stats say? So the metrics on this fight are pretty similar. They both land around four strikes per minute. Their takedown accuracy is pretty much the same. Uh, Bones Jones has better takedown defense. His takedown defense is 94%, so that could be a difference maker. But um, I like the cost relief with DC. And I like how you mentioned stacking this fight in cash. I think that's a good idea. I, I think Bones is going to win the fight, but let's say DC can land 80 significant strikes and two takedowns. You know, that's 50 points. Not bad for 7,400. But um, I don't think DC is going to get finished. He's, he's too tough. He's, too, he's obsessed about this fight. You know, he, he's hungry. He's motivated. He wants to win. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to hedge this fight. Uh, like I, I stack it in cash. Um, I'm going to be pretty even with it in GPPs as well. Okay, yeah. I, I really like stacking this in cash, although Cormier only scored 34 points in the last matchup, so I don't know. But I think he's obsessed. I think he's a good in a good spot for like 60 points. So I'm thinking about yeah. even stacking it in GPPs because I don't know how the bottom turns out. If I stack it in GPPs, I'll probably be playing Manua in the same lineup as a lot of the dogs would not have won. But that's the MMA Edge Fantasy Podcast for this week. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in and, uh, we'll catch you guys next week for UFC Fight Night 114. Alright, Showtime, let me get your quick picks for UFC 214, real quick here. Josh Burton versus Drew Dober at 155 pounds. Who you got? I'm have to go with Dober. I actually trained with the kid, so I know, I know he's got, I'm gonna have to go with him for that pick, man. Okay. Dover seems to train with everybody. I talk to everybody, they talk about no good Dover. Uh, Taylor Coran versus Alexander Alpi at 115 pounds. Uh, I don't know. I don't really know too much about those two. Um, I'm going to go with uh, Alpi. Alpi, okay. Next up, we got Jared Brooks versus Eric Shelton at 125 pounds. Who are you picking here? Who was that? 
Jeanette Brooks versus Aaron Sharkin, 125 pounds. What's your pick? Oh, uh, Eric Shelton. Eric Shelton, man, I was hoping. Um, uh, do, do we have a manner uh, by which we're going to win this weekend? What, what's the decision finish? Oh, uh, man, I want to get a finish. I definitely want to finish this kid, so there's no excuses, you know, no talk. I just want to get the W. I want to finish him uh, via T TKO or submission. You know, I'm, I'm not a picky guy. I can, I'll take whatever I can get. Okay. Versus Calvin Couture at 145 pounds. Uh, let's go with Andre. Okay, good. Bryant, T-City Ortega versus Renato Cornero um, at 145 pounds. Uh, Cornero. Oh, well, I'm just throwing names up. To be honest with you, man, I, I got to put faces on. It's all good, man. It don't, it's more Tano Cornero. Uh, he just beat Jeremy Stevens. It's all good. We're now Henry Burrell versus Aljamain Sterling at 140 pounds. I guess that's a catchweight or something like that. The catchweight? Uh, I'm going to have to go with my boy Sterling. Okay. Let's see here. Ricardo Lamas versus Mississippi Mean Jason Knight. Um, uh, let's go, uh, Jason Knight. Is that what you said that name was? Mm -hmm. Jason Knight. Yeah, let's go with that. Jimmy Manure at 205 pounds versus Vulcan. Who's the man? 205. What was the names again? Jimmy Manure, the British, uh, British guy, uh, and a big black guy, and Vulcan owns the mayor, just, just upset OSP and Misha Sucking Now. Uh, let's go with the first guy, the British guy. Okay, Jimmy Manure. Jimmy Manure, yeah. Uh, Robbie Lawler versus Donald Cerrone at 170 pounds. I'm going to have to go with Robbie for that one. Uh, Christine Cyborg versus Ty Evanger at 145 pounds. Cyborg. Cyborg. Tyron Whitley versus Damian Maya at 170 pounds. Let's go with Tyron. Whitley, okay. In my hometown of St. Louis. And Dan Cornet versus John Jones at 205 pounds. Who you got? Uh, John Jones. Okay. Thanks a lot, Shelton. It was excellent having you on today. And uh, hope to talk to you again in the future.